This week on The Watchman, as Israel wages a war for its very existence, some are now accusing the Jewish state of genocide. We're joined by one of Israel's greatest defenders on the international stage who sets the record straight. Plus, a spokesperson for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is here with an in-depth update on the Gaza war, and we meet one of the heroes of October 7th. All that and much more, next. Welcome to The Watchman. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said recently that Israel right now is being targeted not just by Hamas in Gaza, but on seven different fronts. He named Gaza along with the West Bank, which we call Judea and Samaria, Lebanon, home base of Hezbollah, Yemen, home to the Iran-backed Houthis, Iraq and Syria, home to, you guessed it, Iran-backed militias, and of course, Iran itself. Folks, I would add an eighth front to that list, and that would be the war for public opinion, the diplomatic war. It's been an eye-opener for many of us to see the world's reaction to the October 7th massacre perpetrated by Hamas in which 1,200 Israelis were brutally murdered. There was mostly sympathy at first, but as the weeks have passed and Israel has embarked on a military campaign to crush the demonic death cult known as Hamas, once and for all, much of the world's focus seems suddenly to have shifted from the Hamas mini Holocaust on October 7th to supposed war crimes and disproportionate force by Israel. Now, as we've detailed here on The Watchman over the past several weeks, these charges against Israel are an absolute lie. But that hasn't stopped South Africa from bringing charges of genocide against Israel in the International Court of Justice at The Hague. This is an attack against the very legitimacy of the world's one and only Jewish state. Thankfully, Israel does have some very strong defenders on the world stage that are fighting back against these false charges. We're joined by one of them now, the foreign minister of Guatemala, Mario Bucaro. Minister, it is always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us here on The Watchman. Thank you, Eric, and for everything that you're doing so you can be able to show the world the support that Guatemala has for Israel. Guatemala is one of Israel's greatest friends, Minister, no doubt. And you personally, on the world stage recently at the U.N. General Assembly, gave a very powerful speech defending Israel's right to defend itself and calling for the world to stand against Hamas. Uh, tell us more about why you gave that speech at the U.N. General Assembly and why it was so important. The first thing is because it's the right thing to do, that we can be able to separate what we really want to be able to tell the world, especially on the side that this fight is against terrorism. And Guatemala has been very open and is, is speaking very frankly in all the uh, diplomatic arena so we can be able to make a separation on the relationship that we need to be able to have with the Palestine Authority and what represent Hamas to the world that is a terrorist group in Guatemala throughout the president, Alejandro Yamatei Faya, has been working very hard to be able to declare not only Hamas as Hezbollah as a terrorist group. Now, you are Guatemala's top diplomat, of course, Minister, but you also served as Guatemala's very first ambassador to Israel. Just so people know, yes, the U.S. moved its embassy to Jerusalem in May 2018, but Guatemala was close behind also moving its embassy to Jerusalem. Can you talk more broadly about how your nation has stood with Israel through thick and thin over the years? We need to come to history, and it was 1948 when our great ambassador, Jorge Garcia Granados, that he was our permanent representative at the UN, he was leading the mission of UNESCO that goes to the Palestine at that moment and to be able to evaluate and make an assessment. And throughout the work that Jorge Granados made, we presented the, the 
state solution of the two state solution and based on that we have been working in that moment to be able to be the country that help israel so he can become a nation on his greatest book that he he was very clear on the position that we need to be able to protect peace sovereignty and especially the right of the people of israel to live in peace in their land so based on that since that moment after the united states guatemala was the first country to open their embassy and during the 21st century we did the same and we still are in jerusalem with our embassy recognizing that jerusalem is the eternal capital of the state of israel it's not always easy to stand with Israel. In the lead-in minister, I talked about South Africa, these charges of genocide against Israel at The Hague. And look, in your own backyard in Latin America, at times there's been some anti-Israel sentiment uh, among some governments. Uh, in Guatemala, what is the view of your government in terms of taking that, I don't want to say a risk, but taking a bold stance, I should say, in standing with Israel, you believe the rewards far outweigh the risks. What we believe is our diplomacy is based on values, and we have been always been very clear that one of the values that we prevail is peace. And based on that, we have been working also to fight against anti-Semitism in the world. That is one of the greatest challenges that we are suffering around the world. And Guatemala has been very clear, not only because we are a Christian nation, and, and we believe on that, and, and the support of the people of Guatemala has been very clear, also fighting against BDS uh, during the time that we have been working. And this is part of our core as, as our diplomatic has been standing uh, in all fronts to be able to defend peace, to fight against anti-Semitism, and especially to be able to know that we need to be able to work together to support uh, at this moment Israel in these difficult times. Yeah, you mentioned BDS minister. That's that boycott, divest, and sanction movement uh, against Israel. Do you sense, especially in the wake of October 7th, do you sense that there's a tide against Israel in the diplomatic realm? Or do you see people coming alongside people like yourself and alongside Guatemala uh, to support Israel and to bolster Israel in this war against Hamas and these radical forces? All the people that we know, uh, the importance of bringing peace to the region. We need to be able to work together to fight against the fourth generation war. And the fourth generation war is the one that brings all of these social media lies and things and doesn't present the reality on the ground. So based on that, we need to be able to work everyone to be able to tell the truth based on, on the assessment that we really have. And we need to be able to evaluate also on the diplomatic arena the efforts that many countries also need to be able to do so we can be able to join together and fight against terrorism. And, and that's something that nobody can deny. That is true. And you are a truth teller. Minister Mario Bucaro, thanks for all that you are doing, for all the nation of Guatemala is doing to stand with Israel and stand with the truth. God bless you. We'll see you again soon, Minister. Blessings, my dear Eric. Bye-bye. Mario Bacaro, Foreign Minister of Guatemala, a stalwart friend of Israel. Speaking of which, we're joined after the break by a spokesperson for the government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with an in-depth update on the Gaza war. That's next. Don't move. And welcome back to The Watchman. It is hard to believe, but it's now been over three months since Hamas terrorists invaded southern Israel, slaughtered some 1,200 Israelis. Of course, Israel has responded with decisive force in its goal of destroying Hamas once and for all. So where exactly are we? What is the state of play in the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza, the efforts to destroy Hamas's tunnel network, to free the hostages, and what about those genocide claims against Israel? We're joined now by spokesperson for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, our good friend Tal Heinrich is here, joining us from New York. Tal, great to see you. And first of all, we recently saw footage of you and your great work as a spokesperson for the Israeli government in the Gaza tunnels. What's the latest on those efforts to destroy that subterranean network of tunnels beneath Gaza? 
Well, Eric, good to see you. It's my pleasure to be joining you today. Just a few days ago, earlier this week, now I'm in New York, but I was inside the tunnel very adjacent to the Erez border crossing uh, between Israel and Gaza. This border crossing, by the way, is the one that used to serve uh, uh, Palestinian civilians as they used to go out of Gaza and receive medical treatment in Israel. That's where Israeli peace activists, for example, used to meet with them and drive them to Israeli clinics and hospitals. And right on the other side of the border, this is what you see. I went down about 40 or even 50 meters down this tunnel that uh, I think the tunnel itself is about four kilometers long, but I was able to go only to, uh, you know, the, the first part of it. It's huge. When you stand there, Eric, you suddenly realize to what extent they hate Israelis and they hate the Jewish people. They are so uh, committed to the idea of obliterating the Jewish state that they invested so much money. We're talking about uh, millions, hundreds of, of, of dollars in, in this terror infrastructure that you see all across the Gaza Strip. According uh, to estimations of the IDF, there are more than 1,500 tunnels, and I saw just one, just one. We're talking about 6,000 tons of concrete, almost 2,000 tons of iron, um, and this is what they did with, with uh, the, the, the equipment and, and, and resources that went in. So much time, so much effort invested. This is how committed they are to a sick ideology that calls to finish off the Jewish state. Tal, it is pure evil, no doubt. And part of that evil plan by Hamas was taking hostages back to Gaza. What is the latest? We still have over 100 Israelis held captive by this vicious terror group. What is the latest on the efforts to free the hostages? Any progress there? There are 136 hostages um, who we believe are still in Gaza out of the 250 who were abducted on October 7th. We believe that 111 of them are still alive. We will not rest until we get all of them back, all hostages. As you know, many of these hostages, they've been held in the terror dungeons for 100 days now, and they are in need uh, of medications urgently and, and medical treatment. And we were able to, uh, to uh, facilitate and coordinate through the head of the Mossad and Qatar the delivery of uh, medications to them. We hope, we hope to see, we're, we're carefully stressing it, we hope to see this happening in the coming days. That might be a very tiny, small relief to their families that have been going through a torture of mind and soul for 100 days now. But Eric, we will not rest until we get all of them back. This is our moral duty. This is why we're operating on the ground. We are creating the conditions to bring about the release of more hostages by exerting heavy, heavy pressure on Hamas and hitting them hard. Yeah, you talk about moral duty, Atal, and we see a lack, I would say, of moral clarity in many quarters of the world right now. We talked earlier on the show about these genocide charges brought up by South Africa against Israel at The Hague. What's your take on this, this diplomatic onslaught against the world's one and only Jewish state in some quarters. It's outrageous. It's telling more about South Africa. It's not telling about us. It's uh, another testament to the bias of the United Nations and UN institutions and their bias against the state of Israel. But not only that, how uh, they're being used as, as weapons in, in, in service of terrorist organizations. This is outrageous. You know, the, 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 we are fighting the lies of South Africa on the world stage right now uh, for the very same reasons that we're fighting on the ground in Gaza. We will never be stateless again. We will never be defenseless again. And South Africa, instead of demanding accountability from the Hamas uh, death cult, instead of demanding answers from the Palestinians who educate their children uh, to glorify martyrs, they're demanding answers from us? For what? Be why do we want to stay alive, Eric? How dare you defend yourself, Tal? That's basically the message. It's a world turned upside down, but thank God we have Tal Heinrich, spokesperson for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to set things straight. Tal, thanks so much for joining us. Stay safe. God bless. Keep up your great work. We'll have you back again soon. Thank you so much, Eric. Tal is doing great work, folks, on the ground, on behalf of Israel, in the public relations battle. So keep her in your prayers for sure. Well, coming up after the break, we've talked a lot about the tragedies of October 7th, but what about the heroes of that fateful day? You'll meet one after the break, and folks, you do not want to miss this. Stick around. And welcome.
welcome back. We've talked a lot here on the show in recent weeks, of course, about the tragedies of October 7th, the carnage. But what about the miracles? What about the heroes of that fateful day? There were many, and you're about to meet one, General Yisrael Ziv. Here's his story. October 7th marked a harrowing day for Israel, one filled with unspeakable tragedy. In those fateful hours, a sense of chaos and confusion gripped the nation, momentarily impeding the coordinated efforts of the military and police. Yet through the fog of uncertainty coming from the front lines, some of Israel's veterans and seasoned war heroes quickly sensed that something was terribly wrong. One hero, 65-year-old retired IDF Major General Yisrael Ziv, wasted no time taking action. On uh, October 7th, uh, like every Saturday, I was going to, to do my biking uh, around my home. Suddenly, alerts of rockets found me in the middle of nowhere, and I start to realize that something really wrong is going on around Gaza. I took a decision to return fast to my home. I took my uniform, my pistol, and went down to Gaza, feeling that that terrible thing is, is happening there. A businessman in his everyday life, Yisrael is still a reservist who served 35 years in the IDF. He was the former head of operations of the IDF with many years of war experience inside Lebanon and the Gaza Strip. The responsibility doesn't end when you finish your assignment. So naturally, when, when there is a problem, it's, it's like an instinct. I, I just do it. I myself called the division commander. He told me by the phone uh, that he doesn't know what's going on. He himself is in fighting, and he cannot give me any picture. And he said to me, I, I don't know even what to tell you, but if you are around, try to help. By 10 a.m., Yisrael had made his way down south to the city of Steirot, which is less than a mile from the border with Gaza. I traveled alone. Already over there, it felt like a war. The roads were with burning cars, a lot of bodies. Wherever I saw a group of soldiers, there were small squads. But everywhere that I found a squad, I tried to come together and do the fighting. Israel first fought Hamas terrorists at Sha'ar Hanegev Junction and then moved on to Black Arrow Memorial Junction. I jumped into a car with two other soldiers. We had another tackle, very severe one, with, uh, with like, I think, 20 or 30 Nukba that were ambushing us on the road. The al nukba force, an elite unit within Hamas, consists of highly trained commandos. Sadly, at that moment, they held a clear advantage, the element of surprise. We start fighting with them, but once I raised my eyes and I saw the amount of Hamas terrorists, it was a nightmare. They literally took over the area. We succeeded after an hour fight to kill close to 30 Nukba that were there. It's the first time that I realized how bad it is. By midday, Yisrael had reached Kibbutz Beri, overwhelmed with nonstop calls from anxious parents. Their children, young men and women attending a nearby music festival were no longer answering their phones. It was then that Yisrael fully realized the true nature of his self-assigned mission, to save the thousands of civilians in the area. I start myself to look around Beiri. I've succeeded to find few of them hiding around and bring them to, to a safe place. At around 2.30, I went down to the Nova Festival. That was terrible, that was a nightmare. It was a massacre. It looked like the terrorists were waiting for the children to enter their cars and start shooting them while they are in their cars. So I went from one to one to find somebody alive. I don't know, 40, 50, 60 dead bodies of, of young children, and, and I still see their faces. I, I couldn't save anyone. Suddenly I saw that I'm alone, totally alone. So I, I decided to go back to, to Berry. As evening began to fall, Yisrael arrived to the gates of Kibbutz Beri, a community of 1,100 people hijacked by heavily armed Hamas terrorists. So what we've done at that night is sending swads 
into Berry and, and rescue families one by one from the houses over there. So much in shock. Their faces were like frozen, that they couldn't even cry. As a son of Holocaust survivors, to see such a thing was very terrible, was very humiliating. I, I felt very frustrated with that. Major General Ziv remained in the area, assisting the IDF until the very end. While the attacks tragically claimed the lives of 1,200 Israelis, many thousands more were saved that day thanks to the efforts of Israeli security forces and self-appointed volunteers such as Yisrael. The horrors of that day, children and families, I go to sleep with that, I wake up in the morning with that, and I will probably take it uh, for the rest of my life with me. Major General Ziv's heroism stands as a powerful testament to the resilience and unity needed in such difficult times. You know, a big crisis is also a big opportunity. We are strong and we can survive. This is the first mission of the people here after this war, to unify ourselves and to be strong again. Incredible story there, folks. These are perilous times, no doubt, but these are also times for heroes. Coming up after the break, my final thoughts on the times we are living in, what the Bible says about them, and why they matter to you. That's next. And welcome back to The Watchman. As we close here, folks, a few quick thoughts. If the 20th century, the century of Stalin, Mao, Saddam, and Hitler taught us anything. It's that when evil men tell you they want to kill you, you should listen to them and take them at their word. Don't take their word on anything else, but when it comes to that, absolutely take their word. And we saw the same on October 7th for years. Hamas had telegraphed their intentions. They told Israel exactly what they intended to do, and they did just that. And yet the world reaction, as we've outlined in this week's show, has been to condemn Israel in many cases and altogether forget about the atrocities of October 7th. What does this mean biblically? I believe the prophet Isaiah described it very accurately when he talked about times where good is called evil and evil is called good. Folks, that is 2024 Welcome to Bible times, prophetic times. We're in them right now. Here's the good news. God Almighty still sits on the throne. He is in control. And when it comes to his land and his people, Israel, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So be encouraged. It's going to be a wild year, no doubt. But again, God is in control and do not forget that. Thanks so much for joining us this week on The Watchman. Until next time, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace.